I'd like to uh, thank uh, Rajesh and the uh, center for the invitation to come here. Uh, I've heard a lot about Bangalore. I've heard a lot about the ICTS. Uh, I'm already impressed with ICTS. And I'm sure I should also be impressed with Bangalore when I get to see it. Uh, it's a pleasure also to uh, see uh, many old friends here. And uh, it's also great to see uh, lots of students hiding up at the back. Uh, there may be some seats closer down to the front, if you dare. Okay, so uh, I would also like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, giving me this uh, wonderful title, uh, for giving this uh, whole program, this uh, quotation from uh, Rumi. So uh, I, I looked up his poem on uh, the internet, and, and I found that there is another part of this quotation, which I think is particularly apposite which is, what hurts you, blesses you. And by that, what I understand is, if we have a problem, that gives us something to work on. And I think we theoretical physicists should always be looking for the biggest problems that we can find, uh, and that we think we can tackle, and we go away and, and we solve them. Uh, so another way of phrasing it is that uh, physicists are, are attracted, or should be attracted, by what they don't understand. Uh, like moths by a candle. Uh, if you understand something, probably you don't understand fully, but you should look for something that you understand even less. Anyway, what do we understand? What do we think we understand? Well, we, we think we understand all the visible matter in the universe. So uh, here's a, a little piece of the uh, visible universe, and uh, you can see on the horizon there, there are some structures that maybe we can hope to uh, figure out one day. And you can see uh, us physicists progressing towards that. And uh, the progress that's been made over the last few decades has been the standard model, which describes all the visible matter in the universe. So again, the matter particles on the left are the quarks. On the right, we have the electron and uh, similar heavier charged leptons, we have the neutrinos. And then between these interactions, these particles, we uh, distinguish four fundamental interactions. So uh, we've got uh, gravity, which of course Sanjay uh, Shekhar is, is famous for. Uh, we have uh, electromagnetism, unified just over 150 years ago by James Clark Maxwell while he was professor at uh, King's College London. Uh, we have uh, the weak nuclear force responsible for radioactivity, uh, and we have strong nuclear force with its carrier particle, the gluon, that uh, Spencer mentioned in his introduction. Whoops, something went wrong. So, that standard model is great, except that it only describes a small fraction of the stuff in the universe. Specifically, what it does not describe is the invisible dark matter that is all around us, as I will be discussing during the course of this lecture. There's also this small matter of dark energy, which I will mention very briefly, but uh, I am uh, too, uh, too scared to tackle that one. So just in a little bit more detail, uh, the standard model, as I said, it comprises uh, electron-related particles called leptons, it comprises the quarks, and uh, interactions between them are described by what you might regard as generalizations of Maxwell's equations. Uh, the, uh, the bosons described by Maxwell's equations, generalizations of a photon, interact with matter, which is like some generalization of the photoelectric effect. And uh, then at the bottom here, we have uh, the new sector of the standard model that was verified for the first time at uh, the CERN Large Hadron Collider a few years ago. So the, the upper two lines of this uh, theory have been checked in many, many tests at many, many accelerators around the planet. But the bottom two lines, these are the ones that are only checked relatively recently following the discovery of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider. 
So I, I don't want to go too much into detail. This slide is just really to sort of uh, bludgeon you into accepting the fact that the standard model has been checked repeatedly in many, many different experiments, and it works incredibly well. Now, the prediction of the standard model actually depends on the existence, not only the existence, but also the mass of the Higgs boson. I'll be discussing the standard model a bit more in my more specialized lecture tomorrow morning, so I won't go into the details of that uh, now. But uh, the standard model uh, success hinges on the existence of the Higgs boson. So as Spencer mentioned in his introduction, uh, I got interested in the Higgs boson uh, together with my colleagues Mary Gaillard and Dimitri Nanopoulos back in 1975. Uh, at that time, uh, it was regarded as being uh, very speculative, very hypothetical, uh, and not the sort of thing that uh, young physicists should be spending their time on. Uh, so for that reason, at the end of our paper, we wrote, we do not want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. Fortunately, our experimental <coughs> colleagues not take this uh, advice, and uh, as we heard this morning in the uh, meeting, uh, great progress has been made, not only observing, but also measuring the properties of the Higgs boson. So, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before, this is a, an amusing little GIF which actually shows you how the strength of the Higgs boson signal grew uh, as a matter of time. So uh, this is the thing to watch here. So the, the bumps on the left and the right, those are things that were expand, explained by what we already knew in the standard model. Uh, but that one in the middle there, that is the Higgs boson. And uh, as you can see, uh, it is very well described by what one expected on the basis of the standard model of Ranjan. And just for fun, I give you an update. This is a plot that we actually saw this morning which shows you the current status of the Higgs boson following the more recent data. So as I said, I'm not going to be discussing uh, the Higgs boson in great detail today. I'm going to be moving on to darker things. So this is just uh, showing that indeed uh, the Higgs boson uh, seems to work the way it should work according to the standard model. So that's all very well. We can understand uh, what we see in this picture. We certainly expect that there is physics beyond the standard model. And many of the talks at our meeting are concerned with how we might actually uh, tackle that possible new physics, and what that new physics might be. So of course, our, our basis for looking for that new physics beyond the standard model is what we understand about the standard model itself. And uh, this is a very uh, big and complicated subject that I cannot possibly do justice to of this talk. But the various uh, avenues that we're pursuing for progressing towards this physics that we expect beyond the standard model, uh, in particular uh, Higgs physics, or about the entire detailed studies of the standard model, as I hinted at only very briefly. Neutrinos are another possible avenue, and I, I certainly hope that, for example, the Indian Neutrino Observatory will soon be uh, off and running and contributing to that uh, search for physics beyond the standard model. Cosmology and astrophysics are also contributing, and uh, this will be a topic which I'll return to in the uh, third of my, uh, of my lectures. Now, in planning my lectures, I had to make a selection of topics, and so in this first lecture, I'm going to be focusing on dark matter because I consider dark matter to be the most pressing issue in physics beyond the standard model. Here is this vast majority of matter in the universe that we don't understand. And it's something that is potentially accessible to experiments, either collider experiments or non-collider experiments. So I'm going to be discussing dark matter today. I'll be discussing uh, the Higgs uh, tomorrow. And uh, I'll be discussing hypotheses about cosmological inflation my third lecture next month. Now, you may be wondering what James Bond has to do with this. Well, I can make a small transformation. <laughs> I 
another transformation. And I paraphrase the title of his movie to say that the uh, standard model is not enough. And uh, in deference to uh, James, I give you uh, 007 reasons for claiming that there must be physics beyond the standard model. The one is that according to the standard model, it looks like empty space is unstable. So I'll come back to that in tomorrow's lecture. The dark matter, which is the main subject of today's lecture, that the origin of matter itself, the masses of neutrinos, the hierarchy of different mass scales in physics, this issue of why the universe is so big, and so old, and so flat, which may be solved by cosmological innovation. And of course, eventually, uh, many people in this institute working on the quantum theory of gravity. So, so none of these things are explained by the standard. All of them require physics beyond the standard model. And you students in the back there, it's your job, OK? So many of these topics are being studied in some way by experiments that have run too that we're hearing about in the course of this workshop. And I would argue that many of these issues are uh, mitigated, in fact, solved by postulating supersymmetry. As I said, in this particular lecture, I'm going to be focusing on dark matter. So the story of dark matter goes back to the 1930s. So uh, this is uh, the uh, Swiss astrophysicist Fritz Zwicky, who, as you can judge from the picture, was a somewhat special personality. Okay? Anyway, he uh, made detailed observations of the uh, coma cluster of galaxies. And he found that the galaxies moved too quickly. So one could calculate what should be the gravitational field generated by the visible galaxies in the cluster. And then you could calculate how rapidly the galaxies could move and still be gravitationally bound. They move faster. That means that there has to be an additional gravitational field above and beyond that provided by the visible matter. That was the first observational evidence of dark matter. So that was the 1930s. Uh, and this issue of dark matter sort of uh, continued in a sort of underground fashion, perhaps for another 40 years, until the 1970s, when I think there was a real phase transition in the way that astrophysicists thought about this problem. And I think this, astro this uh, phase transition was largely brought about by uh, Vera Rubin. You see, actually looking through a telescope at uh, you know real galaxies, real stars. And what she did was she observed stars moving inside galaxies. So Fitzwicky had observed galaxies moving in clusters. She looked inside the galaxies and found that also the stars orbit, quote unquote, too quickly for the amount of gravitational field that would be generated by the visible matter in galaxies. Again, her observations, we now believe, can be interpreted in terms of dark matter. And the story of the rest of this lecture is how the hell do we figure out what this dark matter is? So let me just uh, give you a flavor of uh, Vera Rubin's observations. So here on the left, we have uh, the velocities of planets in our solar system. We all know Kepler's laws. The velocities of those planets go down as you get further from the sun because the gravitational field decreases. The gravitational field is all generated by that big, massive object in the middle of the solar system. But these are artistic representations of what you see if you look at stars moving around the center of a galaxy. What you find is that the velocities do not go down. They remain constant. That is telling you that gravitational field is not generated only by some lump in the middle, but there has to be some sort of extended source of gravitational field. And also, that, that amount of gravitational field is way bigger than what is generated by the visible stars themselves. So there is all this additional dark matter, and it's spread out. In fact, we believe it's spread out even further than the visible stars themselves. 
So uh, I'm now going to show you a second very sophisticated animation which illustrates this effect. Okay, so that is a typical uh, rotation curve. Uh, I show it again. Uh, if the only gravitational field is that generated by the visible stars, that galaxy should have uh, blown apart. But it hasn't. That tells you there has to be this additional gravitational field multiple. So in the case of the Milky Way, probably the best observed uh, rotation curve is that for Andromeda. But, but the one for uh, the Milky Way is quite decently observed, and it is basically flat like the others. It extends out a long way. And uh, there are also some sort of intriguing structures in that curve. It's not strictly flat, uh, but that's a different story. Another piece of evidence for, uh, for dark matter was provided in the early 1990s by uh, observations of uh, gas clouds emitting X-rays. So here's a typical one in a cluster of galaxies. So X-rays, that means that that gas is extremely hot, must have a very high pressure, so it should be exploding, but it isn't. It's held together, held together by extra gravitational field, presumably generated by dark matter. We've had observations of gravitational lensing have shown that there must be lumps of dark matter sitting in places where there aren't any stars at all, uh, so-called uh, dark galaxies. So here's a more detailed uh, couple of pictures relating to gravitational uh, lensing. So uh, here you're looking at uh, a cluster of galaxies, might have been one of the ones that uh, Fritz Wicke was looking at, and you see uh, a bunch of individual galaxies in the cluster. But if you look at the, uh, gravitate, the uh, line density of matter as inferred from gravitational lensing, what you see is that in addition to the spikes which correspond to those individual clusters of matter in galaxies, there's a broad distribution. So it's, you can think of the galaxies as being a little bit like uh, houses built on top of a, of a mountain. Most of the matter is in the mountain, which is made of dark matter. And then many of you will be familiar with this uh, beautiful uh, uh, observation that was made uh, over a decade ago now uh, of the uh, result of two clusters of galaxies colliding. So uh, you can see here the uh, galaxies and the clusters. They've gone through each other. And uh, well, the, stars go through each other. The dark matter also goes through, and uh, you can see that here. These contours represent the density of uh, matter, mainly dark matter, as inferred gravitational lensing. But the gas does not go through. So this hot spot in the middle here, this is X-ray emitting gas. The only way that you can understand these observations is, as I said, that those clusters of galaxies sit inside enormous uh, swimming pools of dark matter, and that, that dark matter is relatively weak in fact. I just wanted to mention uh, one other piece of evidence for all this, which is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So uh, you may have seen this uh, famous picture of the microwave sky as observed by uh, the Planck satellite. And uh, I like to compare it to a uh, Prantilist painting where you make all these little spots, different colors, and uh, those spots, if you look at them in the right way, uh, give you a picture of what's going on. And uh, in the same way, you look at the CMB and you analyze the spectrum of those uh, fluctuations in light that I showed you on the previous slide, then you get uh, a very interesting set of structures that set of structures you can understand as telling you what is the total density of stuff in the universe, matter and energy. But it also tells you how the matter in the universe is divided up between the visible matter, the ordinary matter that we understand with the standard model, and the dark matter, dark matter that we don't understand. 
So this is a uh, compilation of uh, those uh, various different uh, measurements. So uh, we've got cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, we've got observations of distant supernovae. We've got observations of structures, galaxies, and clusters. And all these measurements converge in telling us that there has to be dark matter, and that amount of dark matter is much bigger than the amount of visible matter. Also, by the way, tell us that there has to be dark energy. So that's a density of energy in empty space in between uh, the visible structures in the universe. So I, I'm not going to say very much in this talk about uh, dark energy. Uh, Spencer and I were discussing this yesterday evening in the jazz bar. We basically just threw up our hands and said we don't know what to do about it. Uh, but again, this is a project for you students that have no access. This is an energy density which is spread throughout space. It's not clustered like uh, the matter in galaxies and so on. It's I mean, apparently more or less constant for, for billions of years. Paradoxically, I, I don't think that the problem is that there is dark energy. I think the problem is that there is so little dark energy. Because if you write down pretty much any theoretical physics model, you're going to find that it's got dark energy. For example, uh, the Higgs model, okay, that would naturally predict the existence of a large amount of dark energy. Many, many orders of magnitude larger than what is actually seen. What we need to figure out is why it is that all those uh, suspected contributions to the dark energy somehow almost cancel out. I think we thought for a long time that they exactly canceled out and then observations told us otherwise, and for the last 20 years we've been scratching our heads trying to figure out why the hell it's there but so small. Anyway, uh, this dark matter uh, plays, has played another very important role. It's played an important role in actually forming structures in the universe. So I, I showed you earlier on this uh, picture of fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Those correspond to variations in density of the universe at the level of one part per 10 to the fifth. But nowadays, of course, we know there are structures in the universe which have fluctuations in density of order unity. So, so how did those fluctuations grow in size? Well, what we believe is that uh, those fluctuations in the initial density were due to uh, quantum effects in the very early universe, a scalar field that we call the inflaton that I'll be discussing in more detail in my third lecture. This quantum field fluctuates somewhat slowly, but it fluctuates. <laughs> okay, and then uh, when eventually it uh, relaxes into its uh, vacuum state, those fluctuations, quantum fluctuations, became the density fluctuations, which we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation. So you had these fluctuations in the density of the universe. But those, as I mentioned, were at the level of one part in 10 to the fifth. And we are density fluctuations at the level of unity. So how did that happen? That happened we think, because there was all this dark matter in the universe. And that dark matter was subject to gravitational instability. It fell all into the valleys in this fluctuating distribution. And after it had fallen into the valleys, it formed like the nuclei for the subsequent condensation of galaxies, and, uh, clusters of galaxies that we see in the And this theory of structure formation is incredibly successful, as you can see from this picture. And it confirms this idea with which, if I want to put numbers on it, tells us that density of visible matter in the universe is about 5%. The density of dark matter is about 25%. And the rest is dark energy. That's the uh, concordance model of cosmology that explains all these observations. So I sometimes like to compare the universe to a sort of a cosmic pizza, where you've got uh, various different uh, toppings, 
your pizza. Uh, so you, you go to the uh, pizzeria and you say, well, I want a universe which has 70% uh, dark energy, a few percent ordinary matter. No, I don't want many neutrinos, thanks very much. And I want 25 or 30 percent dark matter. That sounds like a rather strange recipe for a universe, but that's what we have, and that's what we have to try to understand. And uh, in particular, let's try to understand this dark matter. So here is an edge on picture. Oops, sorry, a face-on picture of a, of a typical uh, spiral galaxy, much like our own. And uh, so we're orbiting some insignificant star, you know, like one of those over there. And uh, we are literally uh, swimming in a pool of, of dark matter. So uh, if I take this uh, bottle of water, then uh, you know, there's a fighting chance, maybe one in 10, at any given moment, it contains a dark matter particle, depending on your theory of dark matter. The problem is that that dark matter particle is going through maybe a thousandth of the velocity of light, and it's extremely weakly interacting. So figuring out what on earth it is, uh, is, is tough. And there's many different hypotheses for what that dark matter might actually be. And uh, the one that I'm going to be pursuing in the rest of this talk is a, a weakly interacting massive particle, a so-called WIMP. And it should be said that, that WIMPs are, are only one among many different possible candidates for what that dark matter might be. And uh, this slide here illustrates uh, some of the possibilities. Some of them are very heavy, some of them are extremely weakly interacting, some of them are quite strongly interacting. Uh, but my own particular favorite is this uh, weakly interacting massive particle, and so that's the one I'm going to be focusing on. So, so we believe that these particles uh, very likely were in thermal equilibrium in the very early universe when it was you know, maybe a, a fraction of a picosecond old. Then as the universe expanded, the density of these dark matter particles would have gradually thinned out till eventually it froze at one particular level. And that's illustrated over here. So you start off with a thermal distribution, particles annihilate, and eventually they freeze out. Now the, the amount of particles that you get depends on how effective those annihilations are. But for typical annihilation cross-sections, you find that you get a density of dark matter comparable to what the cosmologists want if that WIMP weighs somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times the proton, 100 and 1,000 GeV. That's why I say that this is a, a very prom promising, pressing problem that maybe we can solve uh, with collider experiments or with non-collider experiments in the foreseeable future. But I should Again, make the caveat that there are other candidates for what that dark matter might be. And some of them are extremely tough to discover experimentally. So, uh, those of you who've been participating in, uh, in the meeting uh, will be familiar with this sort of picture. It's a sort of a representation of how the dark matter particles dm interact with the standard model particles sm. And that interaction has to go through some sort of new physics. And we don't know what that new physics might be, and this is one of the main things that we're going to be talking about in the rest of this talk, and what we try to find out now at the CERN Large Hadron Collider. So what I've been talking about on the previous slide was how those dark matter particles would have annihilated in the early universe to produce standard model particles. But what we're doing at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is precisely the reverse. We're colliding standard model particles, and we're going through that new physics and hopefully making dark matter particles. Then, if we want to detect that dark matter particle going through the bottle of water, we want to look at a process where a dark matter particle 
hits a standard model particle and scatters off it. That's another possible way of uh, trying to detect this time astrophysical dark matter. And one could also look for uh, annihilations going on not in the early universe, but today into standard model particles. That's something which we've also been hearing about in the course of this meeting. So in the rest of this talk, I'm not going to be saying very much about uh, this process up here, but I will be saying something about these two processes up here. So this is a sort of a cartoon produced by uh, one of the uh, CERN LHC experiments illustrating what they're looking for when we say that they're looking for dark matter. So uh, they collide two photons, they produce a bunch of garbage, in this case, supersymmetric garbage. Okay? And then that supersymmetric garbage eventually decays into dark matter particles uh, written here in red. Now, you don't see those dark matter particles directly because uh, they're postulated to be uh, without electric charge, only weakly interacting. But they do carry away energy and momentum. So what you try to do is to design an experiment where you pick up all this other garbage that's produced in the event, and you measure carefully that other garbage, and you hope to be able to pick out the fact that there is some energy and momentum missing, hopefully, by these red particles over here. So this is a, a simulation uh, produced a while back by the CMS collaboration uh, of what such an event might look for. So uh, here is uh, the other stuff that's produced in the event. Uh, these towers here uh, are not skyscrapers in downtown Bangalore. No, th these are deposits of energy in different parts of the detector. And uh, this is again represented here. So you can imagine that the photons collide into the screen. Stuff comes out uh, at angles. And you measure the energy of that stuff. And in this particular simulation, you can see, well, there's a lot of energy over this side, but nothing very much over that side. And that's because in this uh, simulated event, uh, the dark matter particles came out in the uh, top left-hand corner of the uh, detector. Uh, so you've got apparently unbalanced energy and momentum. So uh, just in case you're wondering, uh, the Atlas and CMS experiments at the LHC look carefully for such events, but they haven't seen anything over and above what you'd expect in the standard model. After all, in the standard model, uh, you might produce neutrinos that you carried away uh, missing the energy. So the LHC hasn't uh, seen uh, any such events. Uh, no dark matter wimps so far. Uh, we uh, heard in one of the talks this morning uh, so some of my uh, dark friends are getting a little bit discouraged. In particular, my dark supersymmetric friends are getting a bit discouraged. But uh, nothing else has been seen either. Uh, so I think that we shouldn't be dis any more discouraged than anybody else. Uh, and uh, I think that we should uh, keep on looking. Okay, so that was... Uh, what we can do at uh, the LHC. So the other type of search for dark matter that I wanted to mention is uh, like looking in my uh, bottle of water, actually not literally in my bottle of water, looking uh, inside uh, a detector with uh, lots of nuclei, uh, some deep underground laboratory which is thoroughly shielded from, uh, for example, cosmic rays and any other uh, radioactivity that uh, might send particles into the detector. So you've got a well-shielded detector, and you look for some event which looks like this, where all of a sudden some nucleus starts moving, presumably as a result of a collision which causes it to recoil. And then there are various strategies that have been uh, proposed for uh, looking determine what sort of particle might have caused that, uh, that recoil. As I said, 
you don't actually see the dark matter particle itself, of course, because it uh, is weakly interacting with the hyperelliptic charge, so it just passes through the detector like a ghost. So this is a compilation that was uh, done uh, a couple of years ago, uh, showing, uh, again, the negative results of all those searches directly for astrophysical dark matter. So uh, here, on the horizontal axis, we've got uh, the possible mass of this uh, weakly interacting particle. Uh, the vertical axis, that's cross-section. So there's a, a sort of a yellow, muddy-colored region at the bottom. Uh, and that is the level at which we could expect to see some background coming from neutrinos. Neutrinos coming from the sun. There's neutrinos coming from the cosmic rays. And those will produce, at some level, a background which could be confused with uh, this direct dark matter scattering that we're interested in. So this is what is commonly called neutrino flaw, which is marked by that sort of red dashed line. So here is, uh, you can see, there's an enormous experimental effort going in to trying to look for such events and eventually push down to the level of that neutrino flaw. But there have been some positive claims, uh, but uh, the interpretation of those is extremely controversial in particular uh, because there are other experiments that uh, don't see any signal corresponding to that particular cross-section, that particular mass of wind particle. So as I said, th this plot was actually produced a couple of years ago, and uh, the current limit is, is more somewhere around here. So it pushed on down, and you can see there are uh, experimental prospects going all the way down close to that neutrino floor. So what, what I've been so far is, is fairly generic. Right? I mean, here I've got the wind mass. I don't particularly care from point of view of what I've been discussing up to now, what that weak interactive massive particle might be. And uh, when I was discussing the LHC search, uh, also I wasn't specific about what model I might have in mind. Uh, experimentalists maybe were thinking about supersymmetry, but uh, one could compare the LHC searches and the dark matter searches in more or less model independent way. So, so this is... Uh, the result of uh, one such uh, comparison, uh, which was uh, done by uh, the CMS collaboration using basically all the data they have uh, so far. So uh, if we look at this uh, left-hand plot here, so uh, these lines here, these represent uh, the current uh, limits established by those direct uh, dark matter search experiments. And uh, this red line here corresponds to uh, searches for missing energy events at uh, the LHC. So there's two plots here because uh, you have to make some hypothesis about that box sitting in the middle. I said, well, the interaction between dark matter and standard model particles goes through some sort of new physics. We don't know exactly what that new physics is. So is actually two plots, assuming that the interaction between the dark matter and the standard model is mediated by some massive vector particle Z prime. And then there's a question of whether that Z prime interacts uh, with a vectorial interaction or an axial vector interaction. So if it's a uh, vector interaction, then you can see that the LHC is generally uh, weaker than the uh, direct dark matter searches, except possibly at small mass. Whereas if you have an axial vector mediator, as shown in the right plot, then uh, the LHC actually wins out for uh, a large range of masses, with the direct searches taking over only very large masses. 
this is actually, I don't know, this is uh, what pretty much I can do. Okay, so I think what we learned from this plot is that uh, although you can put LHC and direct, uh, this is not in the context of supersymmetric models. So, so direct searches. So, so these are in the context of uh, simplified models of dark matter. And I'll say a little bit about those simplified models in a moment. Uh, so this is not in any specific supersymmetric scenario, although you could uh, recast the analysis as a constraint on some supersymmetric models, and I'll, I'll be doing that a bit later on. So the point I wanted to emphasize on this plot is that, uh, in some sense, LHC and direct dark matter searches, uh, they can be compared, but they're complementary, and that comparison is somewhat modeled. So, uh, as I said, that comparison was in the context of simplified dark matter models where you try to abstract just a few cru crucial parameters uh, in the model. Uh, for example, in this plot here, uh, whether it's a vector particle or an axial vector particle, uh, and what is the coupling? That well, there is in some sense a neutrino flaw because the standard model produces missing transverse energy events just through neutrino radiation. Although you can play tricks to uh, discriminate between uh, the standard model source of missing energy events and the uh, supersymmetric example. Uh, it, it does, but maybe we, you could hold that question. I'll come back to it in, in a moment. So, so what might that new physics be that uh, mediates the interaction between uh, dark matter and standard model particles? So, so people often assume some simplified picture for what it might be, so-called simplified dark matter models. Uh, for example, it might be that there is one particle that mediates that interaction that has been a boson, a spin zero, a spin one. That was what was uh, hypothesized on the slide that I showed you previously. Now, you have to be very careful if you postulate such a theory with an extra vector boson, because as my theoretical friends know, there are anomalies in generic uh, gauge series of interactions. And you have to be careful to make sure that all those triangle diagrams get cancelled out. So I think the people who construct these uh, simplified models know about this very well. Uh, but uh, a couple of months ago, together with uh, a colleague at King's and his student, uh, we set out to analyze this problem systematically. What is what is the minimal simplified model that is consistent with the absence of anomalies? Uh, so here's just a little bit of a description of uh, what are the possible constraints on such a theory. So if you postulate some new vector boson, of course, it hasn't been seen at the LHC. And those constraints are particularly strong if that Z prime boson decays into leptons. If you can avoid having it decay into leptons, then your constraints are much weaker. And you remember those dark matter searches that I showed you a moment ago? Those are very much weaker if you have a particle that acts incoherently on a nucleus as opposed to a particle that acts coherently, which would be the case if you had vector like interactions. And you could also make the particle have very weak interactions with uh, a direct dark matter detector if it did not interact with first and gen second generation particles, but only with third generation particles. So we looked at how you might construct models which were anomaly free, which is after all a basic theoretical consistency condition, and also maybe had no couplings to leptons, maybe had only axial couplings, and maybe only coupled to the third generation. Well, it's a spin one particle, it has to be a gauge particle, right? So, of course, you could postulate a spin zero particle, right? Then it would be a, a different game. So, uh, we actually found it's quite difficult 
to have a, a simple theory where the Z prime boson does not decay into leptons. So this actually means that most of those models that people write down are actually extremely vulnerable to uh, LHC searches. And moreover, what we found is that unless you make a theory with more than one dark particle, then the dark particle has to have a vector-like coupling to standard model particles. So it's also very vulnerable to those direct dark matter detection experiments. So if you wanted to weaken the constraints from the dark matter experiments, you'd have to have another dark fermion. But in simple models of that type, you're still stuck with a coupling with leptons. So you're still vulnerable to the LAC. What we found was that the minimal models that would be, uh, if you like, able to evade these strong constraints from direct dark matter detection and from the LHC required, in addition to your dark matter particle, at least two other dark particles with different U15 charges, which could give you all sorts of interesting experimental signatures we now exploring. So the, the, the message of this slide is that anomaly free dark matter models are not so simple. Okay, so if you're going to make a theory which is not so simple, why don't you go for something which is at least beautiful? And here we come finally to supersymmetry. So supersymmetry, uh, I think uh, many of us uh, theorists uh, regard as I said, a really beautiful theory. It connects together particles with, with different spin, uh, all the way up to uh, spin two uh, of the graviton. And uh, if you're not convinced that it's a beautiful theory, uh, let me compare the particles to ballet dancers. So those ballet dancers, those particles are, are spinning at different rates, like doing pirouettes. And sometimes they go slowly, sometimes they go faster. And the beauty of supersymmetry is that it connects all those different ballet dancers together. So, so many of my colleagues in the front row are very happy with that argument. Okay. But of course, if one wants to do physics, one has to come up with other reasons why supersymmetry might be useful. And uh, well, it helps us fix the particle masses that is related to the so-called hierarchy problem that I mentioned briefly earlier on, and I'll return to later on. Uh, it helps us unify the fundamental forces. It actually predicted successfully the mass of the Higgs boson. And what's important for our story is that the lightest supersymmetric particle is a wonderful candidate for the dark matter that the astrophysicists and the cosmologists Here's an illustration of the uh, minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. So here are all the particles of the standard model over on the left-hand side. So that's the visible stuff in the universe. And over here, we have their supersymmetric partners. And among those, there is the lightest supersymmetric particle. And that lightest supersymmetric particle is what I would claim would be a wonderful candidate for dark matter. So how does this come about? It comes about because uh, you've got these conserved quantum numbers, lepton number, baryon number, spin, of course. And uh, if you analyze this particular combination of baryon number, lepton number, and spin, so-called R parity, then regular particles like you and me, you and Spenter, we have R parity plus one, whereas our supersymmetric partners I guess in your case, that would be Penta. I don't know who Penta is, but anyway. <laughs> Penta <laughs> would have R parity minus one. And this means that at the LHC, we have to produce two minus ones. And the heavier minus one decays into a lighter minus one. And the lightest minus one is stable because it has no decay mode available to it. So presumably, that stable particle has to have weak interactions, uh, no electric charge, 
uh, well, it's a candidate for the dark matter. So then you can look through the, uh, the Spartacle data book and you can figure out what are the possible weakly interacting particles that are candidates to be the dark matter. So you've got the supersymmetric partner, the neutrino, that's probably been ruled out by previous searches. You've got what Spent already mentioned, the lightest neutralino, that's the supersymmetric partner of the neutral particles, the standard model for neutral bosons like the Z, the Higgs, and the photon. And then you've got the supersymmetric partner of graviton, the so-called gravitino. So gravitino would have incredibly weak interactions, it would be very difficult to detect directly. This lightest neutralino, this is uh, you know, the archetype of the WIMP that I was talking about earlier on. Weakly interacting massive particle with the mass may be in the range of 100 GeV to 1,000 GeV, exactly the sort of thing that we could hope to make at the LHC and we might detect in our bottle of water. Right, so, so if it was fairly light, then it would have been observed in experiments back in the 1990s at the left accelerator. And then if it had some intermediate range of masses, then it would be ruled out by those direct detection experiments that I've talked about because they have a specified interaction uh, with ordinary matter that would be vector-like, but way above the limits that I showed. Of course, if you make it sufficiently heavy, then you can get away with it, but then it somehow loses interest if it's very heavy, and it's the lightest supersymmetric problem. So, so this uh, neutralino, uh, as uh, Spent mentioned, was something that we uh, looked at uh, back in uh, 1983. Uh, in this particular case, we did not tell people not to look for it. But, but they went ahead and looked for it, nevertheless. Okay, so, so what I've described up to now is it's a very general supersymmetric framework. Uh, but a little bit in the spirit of Rajesh's question, can one be precise about the model? And the answer is uh, no. So this is a plot that I stole from Nathaniel Craig, which shows you all sorts of different supersymmetric scenarios that have been proposed, many of them also being discussed in the course of this meeting. And I think one way of summarizing the situation is that there are no signposts in superspace. Uh, we don't know which of these supersymmetric models might be the right one. Uh, so what we are doing at the moment is trying to use those data from the LHC and from those dark matter search experiments to at least tell you, tell us what models don't work. So, so this is an activity that uh, I've been doing in recent years uh, together with a group of colleagues that we call the Master Code uh, Collaboration. Uh, and I just wanted to briefly, before closing, show you couple of analyses that we've done in the last few months. So one is a very unified supersymmetric model. So we take an SU5 ground unified theory, we supersymmetrize it, we ask ourselves what are the experimental constraints on that, on that model. Uh, so this line here actually represents the strongest LHC constraint in this particular range of parameters uh, as it was a few months ago. And this shows you how that experimental constraint, the first was constraint coming from LHC dot two, uh, pushed you out somewhat in parameter space. It didn't push you out a hell of a lot, but it did push you out to some extent. Uh, so this here was a constraint on the mass of the gluino, the supersymmetric partner of the gluon. Uh, you could ask the same question about the supersymmetric partner of the quark. So here are the experimental constraints. And here is what happens when you put in this LHC constraint as it was a few months ago. Again, it pushes you out to larger masses, although to my mind, it doesn't actually change the situation extremely radically. What's interesting is that the little region over here, the relatively light squark masses, which 
a few months ago had not been excluded, although I believe that by now maybe it has been, but that remains very interesting. So in this particular model, uh, well, we've got a Higgs boson at 155 GeV, we've got some heavier Higgs bosons, uh, we've got the lightest supersymmetric particle over here, we've got a whole bunch of other relatively light supersymmetric particles. And the good news in this model is that many of these supersymmetric particles are accessible to the LHC. So uh, those of you who are working on CMS are still looking for supersymmetry. Carry on. Well, the, the, that you can get around without affecting these predictions that I showed you. We just chose this as the simplest example of a gradient path. So this again shows you how uh, the constraints uh, changed from before and after the initial uh, run to data. And uh, here we see what is the potential reach of high luminosity LHC that uh, will be coming uh, in a decade or so's time. And uh, so this region here where those lines go up, those are highly disfavored. Uh, this would be the favored region, a little bit above 2 TV. And you can see that there is a region of parameter space that we can explore in the near future. So this is one example of a supersymmetric particle. Then another one that we studied uh, a bit more recently uh, was something which is called the minimal anomaly mediated symmetry breaking. Don't ask me about it. It's just another model. Okay. And uh, here we've got, uh, this time in red, the uh, LHC constraints. And we show here how those LHC constraints will improve with time. In this particular case, the supersymmetric particles could be very heavy indeed. In fact, the best bit point here, shown with this green star, correspond to uh, squarks, uh, which weigh several TT. So the LHC is not going to be able to reach very far into the parameter space of this particular supersymmetric model. Instead, what you would want is a high energy proton-proton collider. And uh, Spenter, in his introduction, mentioned this idea that's been discussed at CERN and also in China of a collider with 100 TV in center of mass. And that could really reach out a long way into this supersymmetric parameter space. This is uh, so, so, so the whole point of the M in the minimal AMSB is that you add in a parameter, basically a scalar mass parameter, so that you get rid of those tachyonic symmetries. If you had AMSB without the M, then you'd be in trouble. I, I understand, but from, from a theorist perspective, right, if you, I mean, when, when you are adding a small M, right, how do I put this all into a single picture? Well, well of course, you know, th this is a general problem with all supersymmetric models. And in any supersymmetric model that you or I write down, there is all this, always this problem. Where does the supersymmetric breaking come from? And why is it that the parameters have values relatively close to each other when there's no obvious reason why they do? Why they do? So I, I, I completely agree with you that this is an issue for MAMSB. But I think it's an issue for the other models that I write down. something for the people behind you to work on. Anyway, this uh, slide here illustrates uh, the vision that uh, we have at CERN for the possible layout of a uh, future large ring, 100 kilometers in circumference, going uh, under Lake Geneva, behind the Salev, coming back completely, enclosing the city of Geneva. We had a kickoff meeting about this project a couple of years ago in Geneva. Uh, a representative of the city of Geneva came and said, it's great, I love the project. 
probably loved the project because it was going around Geneva, not actually through it. I mean, scientifically, the vision of this project, of course, is to explore you know, the multi-TEV region, uh, both directly in the sorts of proton-proton collisions that I've just been describing, and you could also do it indirectly by doing uh, extremely high luminosity, uh, extremely precise plus and minus measures. This is the uh, potential uh, physics reach of uh, such a, a machine, which uh, gets you well up into the uh, beyond 10 TV uh, star capacity. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about uh, this evening. So uh, I've talked about dark matter because I think that's the most pressing evidence for physics beyond the standard model. And perhaps might also be one of the most promising uh, places where we can make progress in understanding physics beyond the standard model because in, in many scenarios, that dark matter is made of particles that we can access with the LHC or with other experiments. As I've shown, there is competition or complementarity between uh, astrophysical, uh, cosmological, and particle physics searches in dark matter. I, I cannot hide the fact that uh, supersymmetry is my favored candidate for dark matter. I mean, I delayed talking about supersymmetry as long as possible, but I couldn't resist talking about supersymmetry in the last 10 minutes. But uh, I do admit that there are other scenarios for what that dark matter might be. And uh, I would strongly urge uh, my younger colleagues to try to think outside the super box. Thank you. Other potential candidates like axionic uh, candidates, and in particular, recently people talked about some spikes in the center of, I mean, the normal models of dark matter not accounting uh, are in uh, predicting some kind of spikes in the de center of the distribution, which I don't know, maybe axionic ones uh, for certain kind mitigating that. Okay. So, so if I had to uh, rate, uh, you know, dark matter candidates. Uh, I think axions would be would rate pretty highly. Uh, so these are, are very light uh, pseudo-scalar uh, bosons. So uh, axions tend to be quite prevalent in, in string models. Of course, the axion was proposed originally to uh, quote unquote solve uh, the strong CP problem. I was never convinced the strong CP problem was such a big deal, quite frankly, uh, not compared with the hierarchy problem. We can discuss why I, I say that uh, offline. But anyway, I agree that axions are sort of generic particles that might exist, and there are some uh, motivations for them. Um, sometimes people talk about uh, so-called Wimpzillas. Uh, these would be very, very massive uh, weakly interacting particles, which perhaps were never in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. And then people also talk about you know, extremely weakly interacting particles, like, like gravitinos. So there are these, these general categories of, super, of, uh, of dark matter candidates. And uh, you know, if I was going to hedge my supersymmetric bet, I think I'd probably put a little bit of money on, on the axiom. I, I think it's, it's just fine, okay? And uh, my friend uh, Pierre Segevi keeps on telling me something rather similar to what you were hinting at in your earlier formulation of your question. You were talking about possible structures in the uh, rotational velocities being indicative of some effect. And so he has argued that uh, in particular axionic dark matter would tend to produce you cusps in the dark matter density, which would then give you ripples in those 
gravitational wave event. There were a lot of theories going around that this is the first time that you had seen like black holes beyond the 25 solar masses. And there was a there's a there's a constant thing that goes about every time uh, LIGO discovers a heavy black hole that uh, primordial black holes might be. Uh, we have discovered primordial black holes. But what is of consequence to this meeting is that they also are considered, at least by those people, as candidates for black uh, dark matter. So what is the general perception of the, the particle physics community for that? So uh, I think a very interesting possible candidate for dark matter uh, it would somehow be uh, taking the fun away from the particle physicists taking it back to the astrophysicists. Um, so they have the advantage over all the particles that I've been talking about. The black holes actually exist. And they have actually been observed. Right? At least you know, consequences their existence have certainly been observed. On the other hand, for them to explain the dark matter, you would want some, what to my mind looks a rather bizarre spike in the... Uh, number density of, dark, of black holes as a function of mass. So there's one particular range of mass which just happens to be the one that's not excluded by many, many astrophysical constraints, which happens to coincide with what's been observed. And you know, these black holes would have to be primordial. How the hell did they, you know, what was the primordial production mechanism? Whereas I think you know, some sort of more conventional astrophysical production mechanism for black holes uh, looks to me to be much more plausible. In that case, they could come from dark matter. So, possible, but please don't spoil our fun. You didn't mention the calculation of relic density of dark matter that beams favor the observed relic density, whereas for other candidates of, you know, it would be an accident, the observed relic density. Yeah, well, I, I, I did actually mention it, right? I mean, I had this uh, picture of this freeze-out mechanism, and I, I commented the density got into the right uh, range if the WIMP weighed between 100 and 1,000 uh, GeV. Now, some people call that the WIMP miracle. Uh, I think as a scientist, we, we don't believe in miracles. I'm saying that other candidates would not naturally explain the relic density. Correct. And this is, in some sense, one of the criticisms that I was making of the black hole scenario. How and why did black holes just happen to have the right mass to escape all those constraints? I, I, I could have said the same thing about accidents. What does GR uh, say about dark matter and vice versa? General, general relativity, what does it say about dark matter and vice versa? Well, you know, if you believe in, uh, in general relativity, then as I was emphasizing in the first part of the talk, you have to believe there is a, this additional source of gravitational field. And uh, when I talk about a weakly interacting massive particle, I'm assuming that it has no conventional gravitational interactions. Now, of course, it's people who question that. Right? They say, well, maybe what we're seeing is the breakdown of general relativity. And uh, there's this whole industry of people that propose uh, modifications of GR uh, in order to uh, explain the data. I think it's very difficult to explain all the evidence for dark matter in that way. Uh, so I, I would love to hear a seminar at some time by one of those people who could explain that collision of two clusters that I showed. Be very happy if they could tell me what the hell is going on there if you don't have dark matter. So, um, this is a question about which I'm quite confused, but let me ask it anyway. Uh, so, the stranded model had a lot of very interesting and beautiful theory behind it, uh, which uh, finally got uh, vindicated experimentally. And then uh, we have supersymmetry, which came from uh, string theory and then got incorporated into the standard model. Uh, and uh, somehow, at the moment, the search for supersymmetry seems to be lagging in uh, uh, 
good evidence, but we are hopeful. When you build a 100 TV machine, it seems to me that uh, the theory is very weak, actually. What, what, what should we do as, what should, I mean, there has to be a theory to tell you what to look for at 100 TV, just beyond this generalization of quantum field theory to supersymmetric field theory and stuff like that. I don't know how expressive I have been in my concern, but. Uh, I don't know whether we have to have a theoretical physics motivation for building a 100 uh, TV provider. Uh, it's certainly true that with the LHC and uh, previous to that, to that uh, we had uh, very good you know, physics reasons for thinking that some new physics would show up in that energy range. But uh, actually in history, if you look at particle physics accelerators, on many occasions, they've been proposed and they've been built without any very concrete idea of what new physics they would be looking for. Now in this particular instance, I think that you know, there is half an argument to be made already on the basis of the search for supersymmetry and the search for dark matter. Um, there's another quarter of an argument to be made in studies of the Higgs boson that would be produced you know, maybe a hundred times more events than we'll ever see with the LHC, and that would give us all sorts of new possibilities for measuring the properties of the big boson. So I think there are good physics arguments, not maybe as cogent yet as they were for the LHC and LEP, but I'm not sure whether you know, we need those new arguments. Of course, politicians may insist on them, but. I'm not a politician. Sitting here and hearing Spenter's uh, comment, I thought I should make a comment here. I think, I think history has shown that it's, it's actually we had a fantastic time with the standard model. And it has guided us for many years, so we fully agree. And we appreciate that one. But there were occasions when there was experiment has done, but there was no, no theory, starting from the muon, discovery of muon, neutron oscillation, and so on. So I think we are entering an era which is going to be data driven now. I think it is the data which is going to give us guidance again, and probably some other model will come out. Yeah, well, let, let, let me answer uh, the question another way. You know, what, why do uh, mountaineers climb mountains? Because they're there, right? And because they, they can do it, right? Um, not maybe necessarily because they want to look at the view from the top. Uh, and uh, so I, I feel a little bit the same way that uh, the 100 TV uh, collider I think is technologically within reach. And I think if it's politically within reach, it will be a fantastic adventure, dwarfing even the fantastic adventure which has been and is the LHC. And, uh, I actually believe that the LHC in this experimental program, uh, I'm going to say something that I shouldn't be quoted, but it's going out on YouTube, so it's hopeless. But, uh, you know, I, I honestly believe it's one of the greatest achievements of the human race, getting people from a hundred different countries to work together, as, some, as was commented uh, earlier on in, in the course of the meeting. All these thousands of people who've never met each other, probably never will meet each other. Still, they're working together towards a, a common objective. And uh, you know, I see this 100 TV project as a way of building on that and taking it to the next step. 